features of this plan. One, the main goal of this particular one was to minimize the tax levy impact. Um, and again, I'll go through different things. That was the main goal. All right, so if we start on the left-hand columns, the two and one, that is our current debt each year. And the key things are that in five different years, it decreases. Starting in 2015-16, it's going down by about a million dollars. In the budget. In 1920, it'll go down another 700,000. In 2023 24, decreases again by 800, about. And then uh, the end of it retires in 2829 and is done in, by 2930. So, those are different years when we mention in the overall thing about retiring debt. It's not all in one year or anything like that. It's, you know, we have various bonds that are either are reducing or, in some cases, being totally paid off. Um, the state aid, when I did this back in March, again, a lot of the things I have in there are a little bit conservative. I just multiply the uh, debt by 50%. Most of that old debt actually is higher than that. But if we get more state aid, that's just, just better. Um, when I use just a general 50% for the old debt, as well as new debt too. But, um, so that's where the budget state aid figure comes from. Um, so that's where we're starting from. Then on top of that, we, when we uh, have a $52.9 million project, we have to borrow new money. So the anticipated new debt is the column in green. And, uh, and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. But as you can see, in 2017-18, that's where the, uh, the, bond, the big bond payments kick in, coincide with the state aid, which is, does not come right away on day one. It, it takes a while because you have to first submit plans and specs and then actual final cost reports and things like that. Uh, but then as the other debt is retiring, for instance in 2019-20, uh, the new debt payments are increased. And again, in 2023-24, as the old debt is decreased further, the new debt payments are increased. So unlike your mortgage, when most people buy a mortgage, you pretty much have the same payment for 30 years in a row, or how many years you take the mortgage out. With bonds, you can actually set it up where you don't have the same payment every year, where you have increased payments or decreased or almost, almost any way you want to, frankly. All right. Um, in column D is just the anticipated state aid. And again, I'm just using you know, numbers which I'll go over on the back side. 
And then the, net, the key column then is the net cost to the taxpayer. It's just adding up the four columns. If I add up the current debt, subtract the state aid, add the new debt, subtract the state aid, is the net cost to the budget. The big increase, which is in 15 and 16, where it goes from 1,500,000 to 1,000,000, is 392,000 numbers, so 1%. As you can see, after that, pretty much stays at a million nine. And again, that's because of phasing it in. So that's where the 1% one one-time increase comes from. The numbers at the end, I put a little cross out. I mean, yeah, theoretically, with the debt for retiring in 2036, 37, or nothing else happens, there'll be a decrease in the tax levy. But um, that, you know, that already said, the debt would continue you know, for 20 years. All right, now, how does the actual debt itself work? Um, the finance plan on the right hand side now, this is going to be where the numbers in the green column come from. The first two years of this project, while well, it's just starting up, we're probably going to take out bond anticipation notes. That's what FAM stands for. You, a school district or government can take out a bond anticipation note for up to five years. You don't have to go to do a bond immediately on day one. And you pretty much don't want to. For instance, the project may end up costing $52.8 million. You don't really want to have already borrowed $52.9 if you only need $52.8. Okay, so you can take out fans for a portion of it, or the whole thing for that matter. Um, I'm anticipating that when we take out those bands the first couple years, that we'll probably pay off <coughs> about a million dollars to the principal. So if I take out, let's say, a $20 million band, I might pay off a million dollars, and then 19 I'll renew. Um, so in this plan, the principal actually decreases by about a million dollars the first two years. Um, the bond itself, the large bond, is anticipated starting in 2017-18. Again, it's to coincide with the state aid. If we find out in the end that the state aid, let's say, is going to start from 2018-19, then we'll start the bond in 2018-19. So I can do bands for up to five years. But now start the large bond payments um, is to correspond with the state aid payments. Again, minimize the impact on the tax levy. Um, one more thing on bands. On bands, you don't have to pay any principal. I put in a million. Legally, I can pay zero principal the whole time. And just borrow the whole 52.9 million is fine when it's time for that. Um, but if we can, might as well knock it down a little bit. Um, the reason the interest is so low, again, is first of all, bands have an interest rate generally of 1% or less, as opposed to bonds. Um, plus, you're not borrowing the whole 52.9 million dollars. In a band. You might be borrowing 10 or 20 million to pay the contractors at the beginning of the project. You're not paying the whole cost until the project is done. The way the bills come in. So that's where the 50,000 comes up. Mostly the place where um, Now, what you can see in the total column C is it's 71 million. You say, wait a minute, I thought it was 52.9 million. Well, it is in principle, but just like on your mortgage, you have to pay interest. So do we. The interest that I have in this plan is budgeted at 3.5% probably way over what it will be. Um, when the architects first came up with this, they were using 2.375%, less than two and a half. It probably will be below three. But I'd rather be concerned with if it's less than three and a half, then it will cost us less money. Um, but three and a half percent is what I use for those um, interest payments. The good thing, about, if there is a good thing about interest, now we turn it over, is the state aid payments. The state aid payments, you get state aid not only on the principal, but you also get state aid on the interest. So in some of the presentations that you've seen, you may have seen like the project costs 52.9 million and 28 million of state aid. Well, if you look at the blue column on the right hand side, anticipated state aid is about 37 million, <coughs> you get state aid on the interest too. Yes, on the principal, it's only around 28 million. But on the whole thing, you get state aid on both parts. The original, um, schedule we came up with, again, back in February, March, anticipated that some of it would be 15-year bonds and some would be 20-year bonds. Again, kind of corresponding to what they decide for state aid. The reality, it may be a blended bond of 17 or 18 years, or we may decide to do two bonds. We can do five or six bonds. We don't have to do one bond for 52.9. I could do a $10 million bond or whatever. Um, but this was based on a structure of a 15-year bond of 37.4 million and a 20-year bond of 15.5. And the repayment schedule is there. Um, now, oh sure. <laughs> the other thing too on the back is a key thing about state aid. State aid, and they changed this rule about 10 years ago. 
maybe more now. Um, but state aid is not based on your bond payments or even your interest payments. It's based on what they call an assumed amortization schedule. The state pays you aid assuming you have, I'll call it like a regular mortgage. You're going to have the same payment every year for the whole 15 or 20 years. So that's why you see on the back of this, the payments, which for the 20-year uh, bond are a million ninety, or for the 15-year bond are uh, two, two point four million. Notice they're constant. Even though our payments on the front were different. The state aid is based, based on the assumed schedule. They don't care, quite frankly, if you happen to have an extra $52 million in the bank and you paid it off in year one, they're still going to give you the aid over 20 years, including aid on the interest you never pay. That's their formula. All right, but the net effect is the total state aid anticipated is in this right-hand column. Now, that column goes back to the front. So let me go back to the front and explain kind of what's going on here. This bond in the green column, back to the first table on the left here, the bond is in effect kind of back-end loaded. Um, the payments at the end are higher than they are at the beginning because that's when the retirement debt occurs. Again, the idea was to have the least impact on the tax levy. What that does is the state aid percentage gets a little interesting. At the beginning, let's look at 2017-18, $3.4 million, but I'm getting almost $2.4 million in state aid. That's clearly way over 50%. But if you go down to, let's say, 2032-33, now you have a payment of $2.4 million, state aid is only $400,000. That's clearly a lot less than 50. It's because the state aid is based on an even payment schedule, but the actual bonds are based on whatever we come up with, which in this case was meant to minimize the t impact on the tax levy. So they're, they're not even. You can see they go from 3.4 million to 4.3 million. And then the reason it's 2.4 at the end is that was assuming part of this 15 year, 20 year, the 20 year as a tail end. That's the 2.4. So it's a combination of the fact that the state aid comes in even numbers, you can see they're pretty much all even numbers. They are even numbers for the first 15 years and then the last five years, which is the end of the 20 year. Again, even numbers. But the actual debt is phased in, not even. And again, the, where the, I get those numbers for the new debt, it was just to make the tax levy come out to basically zero after the first year. That's kind of the quick summary. your analysis here for phase one of your project, correct? That's the one we voted on, yes. Okay. But there is a phase two coming in 2017, correct? No. No. So your master facilities plan that you adopted in February, you chose option three, which has a phase one and phase two, correct? We as a board actually chose just to do phase one. At this point, there's no anticipation of doing phase two because the concept was to look for only major items, key items to complete, and there's no anticipation of ever doing phase two. Okay. So when you adopted your plan and had it phase, phase one and two, but you don't anticipate doing phase two. Correct. All right, so my question to you then is, when you look at just the infrastructure repairs that you identified in your report, just infrastructure, which is essential stuff that you need fixed in all the schools. Mm -hmm. If you just do phase one of the project, you're going to leave 26% of the infrastructure unfinished at Duzing, 71% at Lenape, only 9% at the middle school, and 51% at the high school. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand how your infrastructure plan is designed to fix just the basic infrastructure first, it seems it doesn't do that. So that's a correct assumption. The think. focus is on priority infrastructure. That's what the focus is. But these numbers are correct, right? You still have schools that will not have their basic infrastructure needs taken care of if you just do phase one. That's my first question. No, that's, that's not correct. Um, not every infrastructure, I, I understand that, the, the assumption that's being made is that all infrastructure is equal in your question, but that's not true. Some things are 
major and important. Some things are roofs that are going to collapse, and other things are doorknobs. Okay, so you're you're using a summary number that's saying this percentage of things in these buildings are being unaddressed, but that doesn't incorporate the weight of those things that are being left unaddressed. The reason that that phase one was designed the way that it's that it's appearing now and the way that it's coming into the bond is because the board's interest was in getting the big things done. If there are, you know, something really huge like support columns that are going to be done, I'm talking hypothetically, this isn't exactly what's in the schools, and then, you know, a couple of hundred light bulbs, you're obviously not going to say, well, you're leaving something important unaddressed. Where some things that could be that could be improved are being left unaddressed, but they're not the big things. So you have to weight this stuff instead of just using percentages. Can I just follow an example a second? Can you give us a couple of concrete examples of things you're not? Well, okay. I think I can give uh, the biggest concrete example that will address the biggest part of those numbers. The biggest thing that is not, that is in, was in phase two, not in phase one, was to air condition all the buildings. That's infrastructure. That's millions of dollars. That's most of that part that's not being done. Was air conditioning a few places was really bad, and we're putting in duct work that can accommodate air conditioning in the future, but we're not actually putting in air conditioning in every single classroom in the district. And that's probably six, seven million of, of that, what was left out. So you have 9% left, though, at the middle school in phase two. And these others, I'm just using your infrastructure numbers. So what Steve is saying is that basically certain items are more important than others. Yes, of course, and it was, you know, the previous board that made that selection. Your facilities plan was broken into two pieces, infrastructure work and then 21st century learning work, correct? So you were doing the work, the basic work, take care of the basic needs of all the schools, and then as part of the second segment, you were trying to increase the, the square footage of your buildings to increase the 21st century educational model, right? Um, yeah, some of the square footage changes and, and they're actually incorporated in what's being proposed right now have to do with overpopulation, uh, not not specifically well, it's still part learning. of the it's in some, but it is, but I'm just saying that it's not like we're widening up floor space simply to accommodate curriculum right. changes so or desires. We're accommodating population. My point is you haven't taken care of all your infrastructure needs you identified. Okay, phase one. Let me use maybe an example. Let it be. There wasn't that much infrastructure to do, so it's 800,000, so it looks like, oh, there's 71% left. Well, the air conditioning was left out. Since there wasn't that much left, it looks like a high percentage was left out. The middle school, since we're doing so much infrastructure, the air conditioning percentage looks a lot smaller. That's why the percentages are different. So it's 9% there. How about the high school, 51? Again, the air conditioning would be yeah. sizable, and the air, uh, high school is a huge building. The air conditioning would be quite large. And so if we're not doing that much of the other, we're doing the stuff we need to do, but we're not doing phase anything. one, phase two will not happen, correct? All right. Next question I have for you, Rick. On your numbers, you, you made several assumptions, and I want to review your assumptions sure. so that we can kind of test the validity of those. When you look at the, the first page, which starts with 2014-15, current debt, yes. 2756-18, I see that you got that directly from the line item in the 2014-15 budget. Correct. However, the state aid number in your budget is dramatically higher than what you put here. Correct. So why is that? Because the state aid that we're seeing this year includes aid from all debt that's already retired. So I was just using the aid on the debt that's going forward. We're, we're, there's, you mentioned that the state aid is a set amount and the debt is whatever. We're still receiving some state aid on debt that retired a year or two ago. But I didn't I put that in there because I wanted to base this on just the two bonds that are left. But yeah, we can put in, I think it's 1.5 million. It's supposed to be 1, 5, 8, 9, 5, 9, 1. So if that was, and if that in fact is what you're paying this year, are you getting this year state aid? Yes, so we anticipate that was under okay, governor's so We won't actually know the final state aid when does it come out until December 1st. But you budgeted year. for 1, 5, 8, 9, yes. 5, 9, Mm -hmm. which would mean that your net tax levy cost is lower than you've expressed here. Your net tax levy cost for 14-15 is 1166529, not 1517. Okay, well again, I was just basing this on the two bonds that are left. No, but, um, well, if you're basing it on the two bonds that are left, then your current debt is a lot less because you have three, 
items that you're bonding for. You have a refinance bonds, and a the 11 and one, and then you have a firm energy, correct? I have an energy performance. Right. So if you're listing here the total debt from the budget, then you should be listing your total building aid from the budget. Otherwise, you're overstating the net cost of the tax levy in the, the column that you have here is 1517. Well, why did you do that? Again, because I was just comparing the two bonds for the life of this that were left, I should list energy performance contract with the new bond. But the two, I mean, we have other state aid too that's a one-time shot this year. But when you look at the budget, you see it clearly as building aid. Yeah. One, five, eight, nine, five, nine, one. All right, so shouldn't this number over here be one, one, six, five, two, nine? I can't see what your point is. You're showing here uh, a My number. eyes are not that good, I'm sorry. It's I your top see. number. No here. clue. Just right. playing to this. Oh, that one, okay. Shouldn't that number be readjusted? Could be readjusted, but I could put all the other state in there too, and it would be readjusted again. I mean, okay. So, for instance, the gap elimination adjustment is negative 1.5 million. We get even a third of that back, that'll be an increase of 500,000. So, yeah, there's lots of state aid I could put in there. I was just on this putting the state aid for the bonds that were still remaining. Well, then, if you're going to do that, then you should have put in the debt associated with just the two bonds remaining. The one that retires in 18 and 19, and the one in 2022 and 23. And the energy performance contract. Well, what I'm saying to you is if you're putting in the state aid you're getting on two budgets, then you should just show the impact on the two bonds in terms of costs. You're trying to show the net impact on the tax level. Yes. So you shouldn't overstate it. If you're going to use a total budget number, then you should use a total aid number, not just for two bonds, to, to express the correct number in that column. If you want to express the number for the two bonds, I think it's 245, 2,450,000 for the two. Principal interest on the refined bonds and principal interest on the 11 one. But you're also, there's also an energy performance contract that day. I know, but you're, so if you're going to put that in there in the total number, you should be putting the total state aid in there too. Otherwise, what you're doing is overstating that number, which has an impact on the gap going forward, right? That's point number one, okay. all right? Point number two, your net long-term debt here, did it change over the last two years? Because your financial report from 2011. Well, yeah, it's energy performance contract. We just started paying this year. Okay, how much did you borrow on that? About 300? About 4 million. 4 million, 3 million. 4 million. About 4 million. Okay, so is that the two? million, twenty-three thousand. What's the period of repayment of that? Um, it is scheduled for a 15-year repayment, but it has an option of prepayment, which most bonds don't. It's not actually a bond. It's actually more like a mortgage. We can prepay any amount we want in various years. So, you know, what we decide some year, let's pay an extra 200000 Is that the 286 that remains in the end years then? Yeah. Get aid on 60% of that. No, 66% of that. Or 
eight ratio is so sixty six percent. Our eight ratio is actually a sixty point seven, but I've used sixty. So you believe that you're going to get sixty six percent eight on fifteen five? Yes. Okay. How do you know that you're going to get that? We don't know. It might be higher. It was a conservative estimate that the architects first came up with, that I've also used in previous projects. It may very well be a bit more eight than that. That's my conservative point, estimate. But Rick, my point is, building eight specific calculation based upon the work you do. All right? Do you understand how building aid is calculated? That's what I want to know. Yes. Right. yes. So tell me how building aid is calculated on new construction. Build on a 20 year, say it's a 20 year addition. How do you calculate building aid? What they do in real rough terms, um, they take a look and they take a look at what is the maximum amount of building aid on each building. And they base that on the capacity of the building, um, how many students it can hold, and things like that. Now, some of it is based on old formulas from the 1960s, but in general terms, a regular classroom is uh, assumed to be able to hold 27 students, just for example. Doesn't mean we want to put 27, that's how the aid formula works. That being said, if I have a classroom that is under 770 square feet, I can label that for state aid purposes as a closet or an office, and therefore the capacity is zero students. You, when you're doing new additions, if you have classrooms in an old building that are less than this 770 square feet, which is the number they came up with many years ago, you can label those as either special ed rooms or offices, and therefore justify why you need to build additional space and get that eatable. If all of your classrooms are 770 square feet, can't do that, and it's harder then to justify the new construction to be aidable because you have to justify that either you have an increased population to, to justify it. We have a little bit, but we don't have a lot. It's pretty, pretty stable for 12 years at least. Or you justify that you need new classrooms because your current classrooms aren't the, the standard square footage, therefore they don't count as eight, and you justify Rick, 27 Rick, through 7. What is the formula for? Establishing the maximum number of interchangeable classrooms you can have in a school. I'm not sure what you mean by interchangeable classrooms. Classrooms used for educational purposes, for teaching English, teaching English, 20, social studies. 27 stuff. in the classroom. 27 divided by, you divide what number by 27 to come up with a number? I'm not sure what you did. The number of students you have in the school. So you take the number of students you have in the school, you divide by 27, up with a maximum number of interchangeable classrooms you can have in a school because SED doesn't want you overbuilding a particular building. Correct. Correct. Now, when you fi figure out building aid on new construction, what's the first component you start with? Can, can we I'm hold on? Sure. So can, can we, we, let's, let's, I want to back up for a second. I'd like to continue. No, it is, but Rick's, Rick's having trouble understanding what what Kevin's getting at, and I can see why, and I want to see if I can help focus the question, and that might help us get better to a better answer. The actual state aid system is very complicated. It will reimburse a classroom as defined by them as a classroom, not necessarily by you as a classroom at a certain rate. It'll reimburse administrative space at a different rate. It'll reimburse storage space at a different rate. The reason that SED can't tell you today what our exact reimbursement amount is going to be on this bond is because we haven't had architects yet writing up all the blueprints. We've got a floor plan. We've got a general rough of what it is that we're asking the public to finance here. But we don't have finished designs. And we're not even going to hire an architect, an architect to create finished designs that SED can read line by line until the bond passes, because if the bond doesn't pass, we don't need an architect to do that. So it's, it's a little more difficult than to, to be quite as specific about the answers to these questions as Kevin would like to be. What we do have going for us right now, and the reason we talk about this 50% rate, is because we have been working for the last several years with architects who set up this floor plan, and they've designed many schools that have been built and been reimbursed based on this system. We're working with uh, a project manager with Palumbo Associates that have 
physically built many schools and, and gotten the reimbursement arranged for that floor space. And so they have experience looking at what the needs are in the plan and what the rough floor plan looks like for each building and the different kinds of things you're doing, whether it's room dividers, classrooms, the different categories and kinds of things that you're doing within that setup to say pretty much this is what you've got here and even though you can't give people down to the last penny, what they're going to be receiving because the, the actual blueprints haven't been written and submitted to SED yet. And then we try to we try to back about 8 or 10 percent off that so that it'll be conservative, so that nobody will think that we're overstating the state aid. No, so we can't really, you're asking a lot of very, very specific questions, but we can't really give okay. you that specificity. And, and that's the problem I have, because the specificity could have been obtained by calling the Department of Education, State Education. There's a building rep assigned to this school district. Her name is Jean Baudet. I've talked to her about 40 times over the last 20 days. Rick called her once and asked her for general information. This is the woman that you would go and meet with and introduce your plans to her, and she would tell you what the amount of state aid that she could probably attribute to the project. And then her figures are then given to another woman that I talked to. Her name is Louise Gowry. She's at state aid. I sent her Rick's form and asked her to comment on it. I'm going to get into that in a second. My point is, Steve, it's very specific, and the school district should know. You take what's called a building, the building aid units from your educational space. Now, a building aid unit is the, the essential core structure of coming up with how much building aid you get. All right? So each classroom that has more than 770 square feet gets 30 building aid units. And what you do is you take up and add up all your building aid units that you get. Currently, the middle school has 625 building aid units assigned to the current space. The high school has 710, but that includes special education. So when you figure out building aid, you look at the BAUs, the building aid units, that the project generates, and you're right. You don't get state aid for a lot of things, like storage closets you don't get aid for. You get aid for educational space that you create. What Rick Linden is saying, in order to make the project work, he'll take a classroom, turn it into storage to convince SED now that he has to build a new classroom, and you get aid that way. So you start with the BAUs. You take the BAUs and you multiply them by a construction cost index that's published on the SED website monthly. For the middle school, it's $19,133 per BAU. For the high school, it's $20,500. So you multiply the BAUs by that number, and then you have a regional cost adjustment. Because construction costs here in Ulster County are a little higher, it's 1.2895 that you multiply to the sum of those two, or the, the product of those two. And then that number is called the maximum cost allowance. The maximum cost allowance is the number that SED works with. The rule is that you get your building aid based on the lesser of the actual cost of construction or the maximum cost allowance. So whatever number is lower, they then apply the, the district's building aid ratio, which is 0.607. That's how you get to your building aid. Then they take that number and divide it by either 15 of its reconstruction or 20 of its new. Jean Baudet was surprised that the finance department from the school district didn't sit down with her and review the project to come up with the numbers that would be supportive of this schedule. Okay? Now, so that's how you calculate building aid. So it's well, not well, this well, nebulous second. thing. That's not, no, it's not how you calculate building aid. We have to be very careful because you're making declarative statements that this is how you calculate building aid. But in fact, SED will tell you that they cannot calculate building aid on the configuration of your existing space, but only on the exact blueprints that you submit once Steve, you're, uh, Kevin, please, I'd let you speak. The middle school Kevin, I'd let you speak to conclusion, and I would appreciate if you respect no this environment enough to, to do that. 
do this in my data. The people who do the project management, Palumbo Associates, the architects that work on this, they have the information that you're talking about. They work with that information. They work with it in-house. The reason that they don't go in and inquire at the SED office that you did about the specifics of an individual project is because they're not there yet with that project. They're looking at floor space. They're looking at the general layout of the design. Okay, they're not ready to get to that point yet that you're talking about. The information is not at the stage of the assumptions that you're making when you speak to this woman about the, about the aid ratios. They cannot, they can only project the aid ratios based on what they're looking at at the floor plan. We do not get our aid ratios given to us based on the existing space. This is a project. We wouldn't be aidable at the rates of the existing space. We're going to be aidable on what's in the final plan that we submit to SED. And I have uh, another uh, piece of information that you might not know, which is that the whole $52 million project does not get designed out and submitted to SED for these decisions, for these final decisions to be made in a single, gigantic, four-building, $52 million format. Different stages of what's being done are submitted at stages. The specificity that you're looking for actually doesn't currently exist, and that's why the standard practices for experienced school architects and school project managers that have cost estimated and built numerous school buildings, they know how to estimate the relationship between the existing aid for the space you have, the projects that get done. They are experts, that's what they do, they're not incorrect about this. I have to remind you that bonds do not go over budget. It's never happened, it never will, and it's not going to happen here. But the, the ratios that are being presented in the school's uh, financial reports about this project right now are conservative estimates. As you can see here, you're looking at the aid ratios and you're looking at the percentage of the floor plan that it's currently believed will be aidable, okay? And then we're backing off another 10% off what that number is so that we don't end up in a situation of having potentially overstated what may come to pass once the designs, the actual designs, are in the SED offices. And so you're, you're asking some very, very specific questions, but they're based on some incorrect assumptions. And my concern here is that as you continue to ask increasingly specific questions that only have generalized answers, that we're going to end up at an impasse about whether we're able to accurately convey to this group, to the public, the people that, that we actually are giving them the best available information. It's going to make it seem like, but what about this? Okay, but what, you know, Steve, so, can I just stop you, you know, for a second? I want to just, I, I'm, I'm at I my conclusion, used, but okay. we, we, we were you know, reaching an impasse, and I just want to make sure that, that we understand that the specificity that, that Kevin is seeking doesn't actually exist in advance of the finished plans. Actually, Steve. Thank you. Stop. Excuse me for a minute, Steve. Rick, have you spoken yet to the fact that you also have spoken with SEB about this project and about these numbers and what they said to you? Have yes. you at least shared yes. that no. with you? No, no. I spoke. I spoke to Jean once. Yes. And Jean indicated that until architects make plans that they can't do an estimate of what the actual building needs would be. So we're relying on your assumptions. No, I'm actually relying on the architects, architects, but I've also used the same ones in other so projects. So he's actually came from the architects. Well, well, Two-thirds and uh, whatever. Is I talked to Jean yesterday, and she was surprised that nobody called her after I've called her for the last 20 days. And her point to me is school districts will come in and sit down with her in advance to get a feel <coughs> for Look, they're your bankers. They're giving you building aid. You should know in advance of the project how much you're getting. Your assumptions here aren't valid. You're assuming that 66% of the new cost of construction will be aidable, and it may turn out to be a lot lower than that. You're assuming that 100% of your reconstruction costs are aidable, and they're not. They're not as a matter of fact. When you talk to Jean Budette, she says you use the same calculations for your reconstruction. So what is just, we got one second. Just you're saying aid can be higher. Yes. In these estimates. How yes. would aid be higher? Uh, if they decide in the final analysis that maybe seventy five percent of the new construction is aidable instead of sixty six percent. 
Okay, and, and you can get received more. Okay, what about the reconstruction? The reconstruction, um, 100% uh, is about, it can't go any higher. So, so you can't go any higher, so the right. only place we can go is down on that one. So yeah. you're, you're, you're assuming best case scenario on that? On that one, yes. But in, reno in projects I've done in the past, in renovations, they're essentially 100%, maybe 99, but they're essentially 100% natable. Because generally, you don't go over the maximum cost loss with reconstruction. I mean, I guess if you were tearing the whole building down and build it from scratch, maybe, but generally on reconstruction, you're not going to get close to that. It's on new construction where you get close to that maximum cost loss and go over. And just remember that this comes from historically demonstrated benchmarks. It's not like we're just saying, oh, it's a, it could be 100%. The, the, the amount of floor space that is believed to qualify as reconstruction renovation is an actual amount. So the, rough, the roughs already exist, the rough designs already exist. So um, it's, not, it's not like that's being overstated. That again, that's something that the project managers have worked up in conjunction with the business well, office based I, I, on uh, an I existing was benchmark. That yeah. makes that eight could be higher. Yeah. No, so yeah. Eight, no that the portion part. can't be higher. Only the, the new other construction part, yes. part could be higher. Sure. But the numbers, the actual percentages came originally from the architects. But I had no problem with it because they're similar to what I've used in prior projects. Right? So they seem reasonable. So my, my point to all of you here today is that you're building a rep at SED was surprised that you are using these assumptions without talking to her first. I also spoke today to Gail uh, Louise Gallery, who's in State Aid. Do you know her? I've heard of her. Okay. I sent her your estimated age sheet, and she was surprised that you made these assumptions without first having them look at the project. So, again, um, my, my and, and talking to her, um, she also said one other thing here. She said, looking at your payments on both bonds, you're not going to get aid on the gross payment to the public. You're only going to get aid on the maximum cost allowance times the building aid ratio. So the impact of that, Rick, is that you overstated your state aid, even assuming your numbers are correct by a substantial amount. So your $431,000 in state aid you think you're getting on the new construction is actually going to be lower. And the, the, the it's actually going to be $306,900 a year. And that's where you get that from? Yeah. You take the $15,500,000 and I multiplied it by your 39.6%. Your 39 so I used your numbers. Right. Then you divide that number by 20. What you did was you take you took the gross amount of the bond <coughs> payment with interest and aid, gave yourself aid on that number, and that's not how they do it. You do get aid on the interest. You get aid on the interest. I talked to the woman about it today. The same applies to the payment on the thirty-seven million four hundred. You're overstating it by four hundred fifty-two thousand dollars a year. So Rick, have you been getting? Um, when you get your, when you get the state aid, are we getting it on the interest? All the prior bonds are that. And we've always done that in the past years that I've been for so many. She, she is saying that you're I overstating the numbers. Think that what we need to do. Did you submit the data that Rick had and and to, to review his information? I sent her the two sheets I got from him the other day, and good. So Rick's assumptions. This is my concern that you're making some assumptions here that they could have been better assumptions. Had you gone to state aid in advance, you're asking the taxpayers to accept your numbers. And I think that, that, that that's a pretty big task right now, given that these are your assumptions, not based on really good data from state aid. So that's the major point I have here today. And the other point that I have here today is that you've spent so much time trying to lock in the cost of the project to a level net tax levy debt cost. If you look at your numbers here, you're trying to keep your your A, B, C, and D costs fixed yes. over the term of the loan. Yes. But in the process of doing that, you're actually extending the term of the loan and creating additional interest that you have to pay. 
because you're not retiring your principal balances each year the way you should be. Now, state aid will be giving you the money, as you said, on a, a fixed 15-year payout or a fixed 20-year payout. So my point to you is this. By doing it your way, your net costs are 71, 715, 947, right? Yes. But if you flip over to the other page here, it's and, less. You, and you add up the cost of the project in terms of the gross payments for 15.5 and the gross payments for 37.4, you're spending $1.2 million more by trying to fix the tax levy into kind of yearly fixed amounts. You're, you're spending $1.2 million more. You realize yes. that? Absolutely. Okay. I said that thing is, my first statement was, this is back end loaded. It was the purpose of this was to minimize the impact on the tax levy, 1%. Certainly, as in your own mortgage, if you took a 30 year mortgage and you paid it off in 10 years, you would pay a lot less interest, but your initial payments would be larger. The board could decide, okay, we want to pay this off in 15 years or whatever, or make it all even, but that would not, the, the purpose of this, the only purpose of this was to minimize the tax levy impact. That was the purpose. It wasn't to make it the lowest cost over 20 years. When you back and load it, just like if you did your own mortgage, you're going to pay more interest. So, Rick, when you look at how you retirement, retire net long-term debt, I did a schedule based upon your information here. And um, it looks like net long-term debt would reduce taxes without a project, correct? Yes. So as we retire the debt, the tax levy would go down. No, the tax levy would probably still go up, but not as high. Well, it's, We're not the going, tax I levy. I doubt it would go down. Okay, so let's put it this way. The tax levy has gone up about 4.07% on average during the last five years. So if it increases at 4.05% for the next five years, you're saying even with a, a, a reduction in the cost of our debt structure, the tax levy will still go up. That's what you meant when you just said, right? Yes. Okay. But I'm talking about just the tax levy attributable to your current long-term debt. That would be okay. Okay. So, given your numbers, the long-term debt would go down 1.7% in 1516, about 0.9% in 1920, 1.05% in 2324, and 0.39% when you're done. So your total reduction in the levy from the retirement debt service would be about 4%. All right. I somewhat doubt that, but okay. Well, that's based I, on I, your I, numbers. I No, I think that's yours. I can't see that. Can I see that? Well, yeah, I just took your numbers here. But I don't know. All right. Okay, so you're talking about the operational. The no, I'm talking about just the debt alone, not okay. operational. Well, that impacts operational. No, I know. Operational is separate. It's a separate item right now. I know it impacts it. Right, but hold on a second. You're trying to figure out. Before we even get to that. something here, and I'm not sure I can interpret it. Before we even get to that, is your 4% figure that you're arriving at down here a 4% figure in the, the, um, the payments that taxpayers bear specifically for debt? Or are you talking about out of the whole $52 million annual budget? The state, the, the current tax levy is the sum, is the difference between the cost to run the school district and revenue. So what the taxpayers have to pay is the tax levy. What I'm saying to you is, assuming a tax levy of $37 million, 1% is $370,000. The reduction in long-term debt over the next years, we'll have a net decrease in the tax levy by four times 370,000, based on Rick's numbers. So if I'm seeing this right, you're saying over 15 years it will go down a total of 4%. All the way to the end. The yeah, last well, year, we'll yeah, down 4%. 2014 to 2014. Right. So it's probably right, right. Hold on. but that's that's under the assumption that we do nothing about our yeah, building. Right. I'm really curious where you're going. Because I'm I'm trying to figure out where in this picture comes your idea of what should be done with the well, building. So I'm really, no, I'm <laughs> really curious where he's going with this. You are? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Okay, good. 
I can't let you go. So, um, if you were just to do this project in a normal fashion, Rick, and like so normal fashion, which would be to borrow the money next year, and let's assume that the project could start next year and you borrow the money next year. Mm -hmm. Forget about trying to keep your debt structure even for 30 years or 25 years. Mm -hmm. If you were to do that and went out and borrowed the money now, yeah. what would the total tax levy be on the 52? What would the total tax levy increase be on the 52.9 million dollars? Are you saying with, with, no, with no A and no retirement debt? I'm saying the total cost using your numbers, what would the increase in the tax levy be if you did the project in a straight way when you're advertising your debt on the amortization schedule that you listed on page two? I need to ask my question. Are you sitting with stated or without? With stated. With stated. Okay, well, the in, if we had no return debt at all, and the cost is progress, and bond payments would be about, let's just use the schedule on that, be about, what, 4.3 million a year? Okay, let's let's stated. Let's stated. So it's that's 2 million dollars. It's 4 million, 337, 855. Yeah, less than two million dollars. It's two million dollars divided by three seventy is what about five point five? I don't know where three seventy comes from. Three seventy is one percent of the tax level. Tax is thirty eight million dollars. All right, so let's take three eight. It's five point three percent. Okay. So the project phase one has an in, had, would have an impact on the tax levy by five point three. The first year. Yes, it would be. With no retiring debt and and Right, yes. And now I'm going to take out my assumption that you're going to do phase two because you're not doing that because that would have 2.6%. And then if you adjust your numbers to what SED told me, the net cost would be about 6.8% on the tax levy. Okay? Now, my question to you is why don't you just borrow the money next year or the year after at 2.5%? reduce the cost of the project and do it the correct way instead of trying to balance it to the tax. Right, that's that's not the correct way, first of all. There's a lot another of different way. Oh, another, another, way. another way. There's a lot of different ways okay. to do things. Let me just I bought my house, I took out a certain loan, my financial circumstances improved. We refinanced to pay it off quicker so that the total amount that was going to be paid would be considerably less. Right? A lot of us do that and it makes sense to do that. If my financial circumstances had not improved, I would have kept my original mortgage and its original payment schedule because what mattered to me most was whether I could afford the monthly payments, not whether the payments would stretch out five more years. Because it wouldn't matter if my payments don't stretch out those extra five years if I can't afford my monthly payment right now. So I wouldn't have refinanced. It was the improvement in my financial circumstances that made that possible. Under my original circumstances, I couldn't have afforded that, and it wouldn't have made sense, even though with the extra five years of interest, I would have actually been spending a little bit more to own my house, and I'm currently spending. When, when the repayment schedule is designed, that's the philosophy that we've chosen to use. What, is, what are you going to actually be paying? If, it, it's, it's not about entirely about what date you get it paid off. If we took out a five-year loan, it would get paid off much more quickly with much less interest, also less state aid on that interest. But yes, it would be paid off more quickly and with less interest. But everybody's property taxes would go way up to do that and probably not be affordable. So a big part of, of being a, a responsible entity in government when something is necessary that needs to be done is to do your diligence to figure out what can you what would be the best way to make this affordable to your community and so what we're having right now is not so much a conflict over the numbers kevin is saying well why didn't you do it the right way well we're a taxing entity and just like you would do with your own household mortgage as i did with my own household mortgage we did it based on what 
what makes the most sense? What's the easiest way and the, 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 to pay it off? Not necessarily what gets it paid off in five years versus 20 years versus 10 years. This is actually the, the responsible way to approach it. You're well, saying, you're using, I want to be careful, you're using the word, why don't you so do it correctly? And what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is we are doing it correctly. We are proposing to do it correctly. All right. my, my question, and I'm going to think of where he was going. In the first two uh, graphs that I looked at, KG and D, use two and three eighths as a number. You changed it to three and a half. Yes. So I would assume that you looked at the numbers and sit there and say, well, if we did this whole bond next year at two and a half percent, what would that look like over 15 to 20 years? Not changing the time period, the time period being exactly the same. What would the payments be at the end of that 15 to 20 years if we use a 2.5% interest rate versus a 3.5% interest rate? I think that might have been Kevin's point, not changing the time. Because my, my point is, if you did it that way, if you did it, I, I, did, I did the math. 15 years at 2.5% and 20 years at 2.5% is a total cost of the project of $64,600,636. The way you've done it, it adds an additional $5,920,000 to the cost of the project plus that $1.2 million that you're adding to structure it, the repayment in the way that you think it should be done. So that's a total additional cost to taxpayers that could be avoided of $7,115,000. Okay, and you need to correct one thing. I'm not going to go out and say, I want to borrow it three and a half if someone will loan it to me at two and a half. If I can borrow it at two and a half, I'm going to borrow it at two and a half. I use three and a half to be conservative. But if it's less, I'm not going to pay three and a half if I can borrow it at two and a half or two and three quarters. But frankly, if I can, I probably will pay it off quicker than this. I was trying to come up with a, a conservative scenario that minimized the impact of the tax levy. That's why I use three and a half, even though the AA used 2.75. Are you going to borrow all this money at once? No. I'm probably going to, part of it will depend on, you know, first of all, I can't borrow any of it until SED approves the plans and specs, which is probably, at best, a year and a half away. Okay, um, maybe a year. And we're probably going to submit it to them in phases. First of all, you have to submit, let me go back a few steps, have to submit it in a minimum of four projects. You have to have a separate project number for each building, even if it's all the same kind of work. Even if I was just doing windows, I still need four project numbers. That being said, I can have as many project numbers in a building as I want. So for instance, I, one of the things, I've said this probably, one of the things I'm hoping that we can get done and submit to SED very quickly and done this summer is the gym wall run fee that can't open now. That'll be a project number. Tiny. The rest will be others. And we might break it into one or two project numbers. We might just do one project number per building after the initial, I'll call it easy stuff. That will be something we'll work on with the construction manager and everything. One of the things you want to do with the SED is if you have a big project you submit all at once, it's going to take them at least nine months to review it. If you submit us in small pieces, Maybe you can get the review in three or six months and you can get going on that while they review the bigger thing. So we may break it up into multiple projects. As far as borrowing money, until I get final approval of the specs, and again, I might be submitting 10 different projects. So let's say they approve this part and I go out to bid. I can go out to bid, look at the thing, the board awards it. At that point, I can borrow the money. Okay, but if they've only approved, let's say the first thing I submitted was a million dollars, I can't borrow 50, I can borrow a million. The next thing might be 10 million. You can borrow that voice. I'm borrowing most of that money in bands. The bond anticipation Lower notes, interest. because the first one, the interest rate is 1% or less. Last time I did a band, it was way less. Um, and secondly, I'm not committing, to, well, first of all, I can't borrow the whole thing anyway until they approve it, but I'm not committing to borrowing more than a whole thing will cost in the end. Now, if I find out, let's say, in, in, um, you know, we do this with the boards, I suppose. In a, two years, it looks like all of a sudden the interest rates are really great, or all of a sudden starting to whatever. If I can at that point, maybe I will take 30 million of it and put it in a bond. Still do spans for the rest until we know the final number, but I could do 30 million in a bond at some point, or I could do a $20 million 
10 year and of 15 million dollars, 30 year or 30 year, but you know, it can be a combination. It doesn't have to be just one bond. And it probably won't be just one bond. So it will be dependent on, you know, what are interest rates doing? I can't borrow anything until I get approval for some plans and specs. And quite frankly, even if I did this little thing like Lenape Wall, you know, that's not going to be much of, out of 52 million. But realistically, it's probably going to be 15 to 18 months before I can borrow a substantial amount. I want to look at interest rates. If they're still low, you know, we may say, let's wait a little bit before we go out to bonds. If they're starting to go the other way, we won't do 20 or 30 million bonds right away. Still do bands for the rest and then change them to bonds at the end of the project. And that's another big difference between buying a house and doing a project like this. When I buy a house for $250,000, that's the deal my realtor signed and that's what I'm going to be borrowing. That's what I'm paying. This project doesn't operate that way. We can't submit the $52 million and say, give us a $52 million loan. That's just not the system under which the project is, is designed and approved and financed. So we really have designed the best possible way to implement the program, to make the designs, and to submit, uh, to, to go out for the loans and submit for our reimbursements on the best possible schedule. I'll make the argument that you guys designed the plan to market it, and not necessarily what's Why? in the best interest. Why would you because say that? you basically backed this into the tax levy, in my opinion. Now, you sat there well, and the said... The plan absolutely did. But that's the same as the development of the plan. But that's not... So let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. You sat there and said you guys hire specialists. They're great at what they do. They've done multiple jobs. Why did KG and D use two and three eighths and you use three and a half? I can't say why they use their rate. I would guess because that's probably the going rate right now. That's probably about right. If I went and borrowed, if I had an authorization right now to borrow $50 million, that's a, or at least a, six months ago, it's probably still about the same. That's about what it is. The reason an interest rate for a school district is much lower than you get is when we sell bonds, the person buying it at the other end, he's buying tax-free bonds. Mm -hmm. So it's a much lower interest rate. It's good for us. Sure. Um, I generally, just by nature, am more conservative, I guess. And I think if I, but if I can come up with a plan that works at three and a half, it's certainly going to work if the interest rate is only three or two and a half. As opposed to if I do it at two and a half and the interest rate comes out the other way, my plan kind of suppose whatever. Are, suppose they're four and a half. Because you, you have, you, you're, you're actually, you have interest rate risk for two years years, correct? Sure. Okay, so? Or at least 18 months. Yeah, yeah. Sure. When do you plan to start this project? After the state approves the plans and specs, and I go to, I can't start anything until what yeah, happens voter after voter approval, mm -hmm. then the architects start drawing up plans and specs. Could be a little project of time, and then how would they do it? Then it gets submitted to SED, SED does the review. Hopefully, at least for stuff I want to do this summer, hopefully quickly. Um, at that point, after they say they stamp it approved, I get a building permit from them. If you're doing your local thing, you get it from the town or the village or whatever. We get it from the state department. They give us the building permit. I then have to go out and get bids for the contractors, which means the, the architects and the construction managers write up bid specs for what's to be done. We go out and get bids. The board awards the bid. And then usually there's probably another month of, of uh, just uh, lead time, startup time for the construction government, for the general construction company or the plumber or whatever. Um, so when it's going to start, it's going to start in phases. It's going to start in phases. I'm hoping, but across the fingers, I can do at least a little phase this summer. But realistically, most of it's probably not going to start till summer 2016. And then it'll be 16, it'll continue 16, 17, and finish hoping by the end of summer 2018. I want to back up for a minute for an idea that went by a little quickly a second ago uh, and correlate to something I said earlier. When a, when a family sits down to buy a house and they have different ways of financing it, they look very carefully at the way of financing it that's going to fit, fit their monthly budget best. Okay? That doesn't mean, that means that they're choosing that particular mortgage that they're going to go with based on what makes the payment schedule most affordable, least expensive on an ongoing basis, and best suited to their family budget. It doesn't mean that they chose that plan because it's the one that's most marketable. 
I want to just be really careful about the, the, the way that this process is being described. What we are doing for the purposes of being as fiscally responsible as anybody would be in their own household, looking at this community as if it were our household, and making the most fiscally responsible uh, borrowing and repayment scheduling decisions, to call that marketing when it's the, the highest form of fiscal responsibility and exactly parallel to what each of us always does with our own borrowing and repayment schedules when we take out loans for our households, um, I, I think that's uh, a mistake to be using language like that. I think it's unfair. I've got a large group of people that have worked on this diligently. From the fiscal responsibility viewpoint, this is not about getting a vote. This is about the belief that the public wants this work done. And if the public does want this work done, what would be the most fiscally responsible way to ask them to pay it back? This is not about the vote. This document's not about getting people to vote yes. This document is about if you do vote yes, you're going to have the best possible repayment plan that you could have on the basis of the size of that borrowing. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we, that's fiscal responsibility. I, you should not try to, to put some kind of negative spin on that process. That is, we, we that is heard, as good as it gets. We've heard from the very beginning, sitting up as board members, that people in the community are taxed to over the limits. Okay? We've all heard that. Um, you've been at those meetings. I was at those meetings even before becoming a board member. So that was taken into consideration when we looked at this. We wanted to make this as palatable as possible from a financial perspective, but still meet the needs of what we absolutely have to get done in these schools. So that was really the basis of the, the 1%, trying to make it as palatable as we could to keep it within a reasonable amount that we felt most people could afford in the community without trying to force more people out of the out of the, the state has so mandated that, that. What's that? The state has mandated that districts and municipalities keep the tax levy low. Right? That's the whole point of the tax cut. And you might, yeah, but this it is might not be even system. low even without the mandate, because that's what we it do. Might not be so the least it might not be the least expensive way to borrow them. Of course not. Either. Of but course it's not. the least expensive way for the taxpayers. Right. And, and that was and Steve's, that makes sense. And that's sure, Steve's that point. Sense. Steve's point was when you go for financing your own home, you try to fit it within your budget. And that's what we tried to do, is conceive of something that was going to fit within the bulk of the And I, res I respect all that. Uh, yeah, I'm a numbers guy, right? What, what yeah. side of the brain is that? <laughs> in your case left you try you try to fit that into the box you know and I sit there and look at the numbers I believe you as a board sat there said what's going to be the least the least biggest impact if you would the least problematic but way? this is yeah. this is basically a 15 or a 20 year project mm -hmm. repayment the yes. repayment and and the again, my <laughs> question to you when you ran the numbers at two and a half percent I never ran the numbers two and a half percent I'm, not, I'm more conservative. I want to run them and see if they work. At three. <coughs> I know if they work at three and a half, they'll certainly work at two right. and a half. He's guarding against possibility. I, I never ran two and a half. I understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying why I didn't. Uh, let's look at over 20 years. Sure. Seven million dollars over 20 years. And again, this is in a box. And I'll be You're explaining that you can't necessarily do it that way. But in a box, seven million dollars over that time period is a lot of taxpayer money. And that can and go we'll if do it's that if we can. can. And if, if those low interest loans, loans are available, we're going we're to get them. We're going to get the lowest interest <laughs> rate we can. This it'll is, mean it costs these are taxes. estimates. We're trying not to be accused of underestimating the cost. So we're we're overestimating a little bit so that people will understand that the more likely scenario is that we're going to bring it in for less. But we don't want to be open to charges that we've overstated the case. So now you're kind of Accusing us of, of, of having overstated the case. Accusing us of this. Okay, okay, but you, you use fit, the word fit, marketing, so I'm trying to be careful. This, you fit this when I have a 1% increase in the tax level. When I do this, I want to see could I do 3.5% and still get the 1%. That's right. exactly what I was saying. I know, I know what you so, Yes, marketing is really is not, is not a, a, a neutral word. And I'd like to say something. I came, either I came late or you guys were early. I don't know. But I don't know. Very embarrassing when all you guys come early. But I, I want to talk just for a second about the elephant in the room. Okay. When we had the $50 million middle school project, it was resoundingly defeated. Yes. It was resoundingly defeated because everyone in the community was informed and aware 
of what the costs were going to be. I remember speaking at a public meeting where I went over the cost that the, that the architects had assumed for fixing up that little building that had been the superintendent's office on the corner. One of the items that I can remember, or not, I can't remember too much, was that the alarm system, the burglar alarm, it was like $27,000 or $35,000. It was outrageous. And when people saw those things, they knew that there were red flags in the whole thing. And look, I'm not blaming anybody, but now we're saying, oh, we can't give you costs un until you give us a vote. Well, in that instance, on the middle school, we had the costs, we had all the specifics, and we had, we had an informed electorate who looked at it and said, no, we don't swallow this. No matter how much we chew it, it isn't good. So what I'm saying is, why is it we're saying now we have to have a vote, we don't know the amount of state aid, we don't know all these costs that are associated, we're, we're, we're throwing dice. And, and it's, to me, I don't understand what's happening. Why are we having the vote when we haven't really been to state aid? Head? Well, we still don't really have, and I want to say something. You, you said the rate is low because they're tax free. If they're really low, that's a component. But the other component is that any municipality has the best credit rating system in the world because we have the ultimate, the ultimate credit system. We have the taxation. We can vote. So we, the, the taxpayers, become we become the, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We guarantee every mortgage. Yes, and, you do. And so, and so, there's a real big concern here that I don't think. I'm, I apologize. I'm just being blunt. I'm not. I'm not trying to be antagonistic. But we look at the board to to educate us, to to show us. You know, this is this is what we're we're going we're going for. And I don't think we've been informed enough as a community to really make these decisions. You know, I I, I just don't. I mean, that's my that's my feeling. I hope you appreciate. I appreciate you guys. That's a very tough job. We know that. And I and Rick, I think yeah, I look, everybody in the room has a good heart. Oh, yeah. there's, there's, it's just it's just a matter of you know there's two magnets you know when you try to put. But let me try to answer one of your questions. Half of what you said we actually do know in effect. We do know the cost. We don't know the aid. Exactly. We have good essence, but we know the cost. The cost will not be one penny over fifty-two point nine million dollars. It cannot be by state law. It cannot go over by state law. Well, it, it has excuse to scale me, back excuse the project. Time out. Time out. You know, I, I, I'm still, still <laughs> but we came in here and we say, there's a phase one, but there's no, no phase two. Right. We never anticipated phase two. Well, why the hell are we calling it phase one? If we're there's not. no phase two. Oh, we're not. We're not calling it that. Well, you did. You said it's phase no, one. No, because that's based on the documents that the, that the board was reviewing before it made its selection. There could have been a phase three, a phase four. You remember there was one proposal that was ABCD? running A, B, C, D, and E. One of them could have been $126 million. The board certainly didn't choose to do that. All I'm, I don't mind being, all I'm saying at the time that the plan was adopted, its official title was phase one because there were many things on the table. It's no longer called phase one. It's called the bond. It's called the proposal that's in the ballot. Oh, I want to answer a, a couple more of your questions. Um, why are we submitting this proposal in the form in which it's being proposed? Well, actually, because we have to. We have no control over that. If you wanted this to be in a more complete form where we could actually tell you the exact aid rates on each piece of floor space, you'd have to go to Albany and ask the legislature to change what SED does. Like, you have to bear in mind the kind of constraints that, hold on, hold on, let me finish, let me finish. You have to bear in mind that we have to operate just like everybody else under whatever set of constraints that they're operated on. Take the town board, for example. If the town board wanted to build, if they wanted to build a brand new police station, which I'm sure we need, or if they wanted to bring a brand town new town hall, hall, which I'm sure we need, you know, there's no, again, you have to, and, and by the way, for the time being, keep that mind in the back of your head, the I'm sure we need, okay? I'm sure we need that, that, that new town hall, all right? I've been in that building for, 13 years now, and it needed to be replaced when I first saw it. So there's no question about that, right? If the town wanted to replace Town Hall, all it would take to do that is for three of the five members of the town board to vote to do that, and whatever it would cost, even if they decided to build the Taj Mahal in the short run to get that Taj Mahal passed and built and the, and the borrowing done to make it happen, would only take the votes of three people. Now, yes, if we thought they spent too much, 
two Novembers from now, we could vote them out, but it'd be too late. That the loan would have been taken and that construction project would already be underway. Here in the school district, we work in, we're forced to work in, under the opposite system. We are required by law to give you plans that SED has not yet approved. You think we want that? We don't want that, but we have to. We have no choice. Hold a second. It, it would make no difference because we don't have the floor plans. They can't review this plan. We don't have designs yet. The designs are expensive. We have to spend you know, a, a few hundred thousand dollars having the designs made up. So we can't do that until the bond gives us the money to make that available to hire the architects to do that. Then we can have full plans drawn up and then submit that to SED. We don't want to do it this way. We have to do it this way. And then on top of that, to make it worse, even though the questions that you asked actually cannot be answered, you as voters are being required by state law to vote yes or no, basically on faith that you think we've done a good job, the best job we can do anyway, you know, a good job, that you, that you trust that we did the best we can on the design, on making sure that we're not buying any Taj Mahal items, that we're buying only what we need, that the financial plan is, is going to make sense within the picture of retiring debt and the community's monthly payment. You decide that we've done the best job we can with that on the basis of what the state forces us to do. And then you're going to go in and vote with that, knowing that we actually weren't able to give you 100% information. That's actually how it works. We wish that it weren't that way. But bear in mind that in the past 15 years, there's been a high school construction project that was finished on time and in budget. There was the, um, the, the Excel project that was finished on time and under budget, which left money free to do other things that hadn't been included in the original scope. Every single thing that the board, going back a good 15 years now, has proposed to the public, that's been approved by the public, and has been spent, has come in ahead of schedule and under budget. And so the real elephant in the living room right now, if I can borrow your expression, goes back to that, to the real question, which is, do we need this done? Do we need a new town hall? Yes, we do. Do we need a new police station? Yes, we do. There's another facility we definitely need that I can't talk about. Yes, we do. The question that you really need to be asking yourselves right now is not whether we're presenting you uh, with, with something that you can't have the last penny accounted for when you go into the ballot booth. That's a given. You can't have the last penny accounted for. You can only have a really good estimate. That's a that, fact. That's no However, you could have the, real question, the real question you need to be asking yourself right now, which as far as I'm concerned, is as readily demonstrated and proven as the same question about town hall, is do we need to do this? And if you think the answer to this question is do we need to do this, then you can look at what's here and say, they did a pretty good job. If you don't think we need this, which I'm hard pressed to figure out how anyone could think that after a number of engineering studies that have been done throughout the building over, over the last decade that have line itemed every single need and what the risks are, and combine those engineering studies with the fact that, a, that three or four years ago, the gutters actually did fall off the middle school. And they fell off, let me finish, during what would have been a school day were it not for the sudden Washington's week vacation. That would have actually been a school day when that happened in the middle of the day. So it's not just engineering reports and do you trust them or not. We all see what's going on in plain view in our eyes. So if you think that the work is needed, then all you want to do is ask yourself, was this, does this show due diligence? Does this show good, clear, good work? There were cost estimates through this entire process. Right. Oh, if now if you don't think we need to do this work, okay. no, then we're, this document we're, is, can I, is can going I, to help can I you. Can respond to that? Sure. I'd like to respond to that. It, 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 do we need this? You know, is great. Do I need an operation doctor? Yeah, on what? I don't know. You know, we don't know. And I'm going to be blunt with you now. The last time we had this with the middle school, it was a resounding defeat. And you guys are now. I, I'm going to be. Look, you, you know, I think if I were in your in your shoes, if I were on your board, I'd say we've got a credibility problem. Let's really go out of our way to sell this, to market it, to let the people know, to educate them. Yes, you can. Maybe you can't come down to the penny, but 
I don't see anybody calling State Ed having a review, as Kevin just said, and going up and say, what do you think of these plans? Give us an idea so that we can go back. So I don't know if it's going to be 2.38 or if it's going to be 3.5, if it's going to be 700 square feet that's a closet or not. We don't know these things. And frankly, gentlemen, you have not given a sufficient answer today to, the, to these answers, that the questions that Kevin's asked. This, this project's been no, no, you're interrupting three me, years. Please. You're sorry. interrupting me. Let me finish. You know, we're talking all these analogies. I once had a builder say a great thing to me. He said, talking about customers trying to build houses, he said, you know, it's really tough to see something when there's nothing there to see. And that's exactly what's going on here. We don't have any kind of, any kind of thing. And the last item I want to leave you with is, there's a writer, Arch Buckwall, and he had his wife, Emily, and he said, I subscribe to Emily's theory of economics. And Emily would say, Art, there's a sofa on sale here for $1,000. You want to buy it? He'd say, no. He'd say, and she'd say, great, let's go buy some flower pots with the money we just saved by not saving, by not buying this couch. So that's the kind of feeling I'm getting from this. It's the arch <coughs> what, I'm, what I'm confused about a little bit by your commentary yes. is that you say that there was nothing, or has been nothing to see. We've been working on a facilities master plan for nearly two years to get to this point. And we looked at Actually, either through K. Okay, can, can I finish, Steve? Yeah. We've had KG and D, an architect looked at it again from bottom up, going into the buildings, looking at everything from every need of those buildings, doing that assessment from an infrastructure standpoint and then from an educational standpoint by meeting with the administration. We did all that, all that information has been put on the website as they did their analysis. It's all been very transparent so everyone could see what we were working on. Based on that assessment, looking at a number of different options, yeah. including consolidation options, we came to the conclusion of the four campus approach. We then also had another uh, group come in, Palumbo Group, which is a construction manager, who did the same ex exact assessment from the bottom up looking at the exact needs based on current construction costs and everything else to determine what was necessary in those buildings based on the scope. So I, I guess I take a little exception to your comment that there's been nothing done. There's nothing different than what was done in the past middle school project. Because I have to be quite honest with you, I came in two years ago with that exact philosophy that I was concerned that there was no plan. We were, there was a project up front of the community to build a brand new middle school, but there was no overall infrastructure or facilities plan looking at the entire district as a whole, making sure that whatever monies that were going to be spent if we were going to do this middle school project would not be undone later on down the road. So when we came in, or when I came in, that was a major impetus to come in and actually do this full assessment. So again, I take a little bit of exception to that comment because we did spend a lot of time looking at every way we can basically break this down and try to come to the most cost-effective approach for the community. Nick, I don't think he was criticizing the work you did on your facilities plan. I think he was criticizing your financial analysis that hasn't been done. I think that's the problem with the project. The financial, financial analysis was done. The financial analysis hasn't been done to the extent it should be done for a project this size. When you have a banker, you go meet with your banker to find out how much money you're going to get and whether or not he likes the deal. Turning to the middle school, this is a, a, a reconstruction project where you're adding to the middle school 38,000 new square feet. Now, my, my understanding from talking to, to other people is you, you're adding the new square footage so you can move students into that space while you do work on the other parts of the building. Is that true? No, no, because then that part's going to be renovated, then the whole space is going to be so, available to everyone. So it's not like it's a temporary you're, you're, you're thing. Think the middle school I think he's misunderstanding yeah. swing space. So yeah. I don't think he's so off by what his comment was. Just explain what we yeah. meant by that. I think, take a shot. He just wants to understand that. The purpose of adding a new space is to, for instance, expand, acquire, and, and move and the space. It will be used temporarily for a couple years during construction as swing space, but that's not the as purpose of it. Space. Yes, that's not the purpose so, of that. I understand it's, it's not the side purpose. Effect. So here's my point. The point is, the last time around, you were going to move people to Tilson mm -hmm. temporarily. Yes. We all wanted to Tilson. That place was a dump. 
Well, we were going to renovate that, Kevin. I know. We had Marie, I'm glad you didn't. We're going to waste the money. We are, too. We are absolutely right, but that's My test. point, though, is that the only way to get this project done the way you want to do it is to create this new sweet space so that you can move kids into the space temporarily and then use the rest of the space to renovate. My point is this. I think you're adding 38,000 or 35,000, 33, 30,000, let's call it 30,000 square feet to a building that already has enough space for kids. And here's, I've done some analysis. After just phase one, I'm gonna say phase one again, Duzine will have 144 square feet per student. Lenape will have 192. The high school will have 202. And the middle school will have 271 and a half. And if you just subtract the 271 from the 202, which would be the same square footage per student between the high school and middle school, it's 35,000 square feet. When you multiply the difference by the number of students that are gonna be in school, it's 35,000 square feet. So you're adding 35,000 square feet to a building that already has 105,000 square feet. So it's almost gonna be as big as the high school and only has three grades. The middle school, when you're done, is gonna have 140,000 square feet and the high school 159. So it's, it's gonna be almost as big as the high school and have three classes in it. And according to your own data, that's where you're having your biggest decrease in student population. Actually, your student population fluctuates. I know, Maria, but Bottom I'm, line, now let me just explain to that. You're talking numbers, and I'm talking in instructional spaces based on curriculum and program at different developmental levels. Programmatically, the space that we're with it that's being proposed is less than what we would have ideally had for a, for a standard based developmentally appropriate cluster of middle school, middle school students. Because the board said only what we absolutely necessarily need. So the concept of what we wanted to do with our teams had to be refocused like what we're doing now into a much, much different process. And that cut out a lot of space. What? So you're talking about square footage in space, but you're not connecting it to any learning expectations. Right, and needs. that's because the middle school itself isn't designed well for learning to begin with. That's true. So the we existing space, you're going to gut rehab and add 38,000 new square feet to it. So I'm just taking these numbers, Maria, from your facilities yes. master plan right. that you adopted this year. In that February. shows that your middle school population will go from 566 now 517, which is an 8.7 percent decrease by 2022. Let me just uh, throw in here this that there's something going on here that's very similar to what happened when we first started this meeting, which when I brought up the matter of the 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 percentages you're using not incorporating any possible weight for any of the components that were put in it. Um, the square footage, as Maria was just describing, in any of our buildings is not a number, like the all-encompassing numbers <coughs> that you just read down. For example, right here in this building, if you walk around it, you can't help but notice really big hallways, really big staircases, pretty small classrooms. Okay, so this building has a certain amount of square footage in it, but that doesn't mean we're teaching in that square footage. That's just the number. That's the number of square footage. When you're talking about the changes in square footage in any particular building, but not separating how that footage is arranged into whether it's hall space or classroom space, there's your problem right there. When someone is designing a building, and even when SEB is assigning your reimbursement rates for what's going to happen to those buildings, they actually measure those specific ratios. They're going room by room. What is the room's purpose? What is each room's square footage? Not what is the building's square footage. But they add up this room, this room, this room, this room. And so and so you're doing hold on, hold on, let me finish. You you're, 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 you're doing something here. You're doing something here, which is again, you're reading down a list of the ratios of the size of floor space in four different buildings, as if the just the simple number by which that floor space is changing is the relevant figure, and that's not the relevant figure. The relevant figure is what is the specific purpose for the spaces that are being designed that account for that change in floor space. I think you're right, so, Steve. I agree you know, with you on that, but here's the difference. 
you're saying that older buildings have older designs that aren't as relevant today for educational purposes. And I agree with you on that. You have some of these old buildings with these huge hallways <coughs> and then tiny classrooms. Okay? So if you're going to do something, in my mind, you should design your space to be efficient. So I don't think you need a middle school if you designed it with 140,000 square feet. You might be able to get away with 90 because you can design it correctly. So I don't understand why out of this $52.9 million, 35 million of it is going to be spent on a one school. And it's not even gonna be fixed to excellent condition. The facilities report says that after you spend the 35, it's gonna be in good condition. It's what it says. It, it will be brought up to current codes, and that was the intent of now the report. Plus, could I, just let me finish, because it's really important to me. This Board of Education did so much due diligence, they took over a year and a half to be able to, and Steve wasn't on the board at that time, but the board that was, I apologize for talking to your back, but um, the board went through a year and a half of collecting all of the data, having, asking more and more and more to the point where these architects said, and they weren't being nice about it, but I took it as a compliment to our board, that they had never had to provide so much data in any other district they had ever worked in. And Is that why they quit? Could very well be, but I'm not gonna, I don't know, we, we have to talk to them. That's for sure. But we, we did, absolutely right? did. But that was public, it was out there. This design that the board agreed to was something, now it's not the done design, it's the conceptual design was based on educational needs, was based on what we need to have, and it was out there for people to comment on all along. I really wish that you had had your conversation with the board at that time so that they could have listened and incorporated some of your ideas well, if, they, if they felt that that was appropriate. Maria, I've, talk, not I've, told talked, you why. I've talked to people about my ideas in the past so they understand what my ideas are. My point to you is that Please. all of us, like Steve said, the town has a problem with its infrastructure. The college is trying to build through a private developer, Wilmer Wright. They're trying to get a tax break. The high school, or the school district's trying to do their thing. The village has to do their thing. The fire department has to do its thing. And then we have the governor that comes in and says, if you look at your SUNY campus now, take a pencil, a mile from the perimeter around the college is now a tax-free zone. That means that anybody that can come to town that can offer kind of a business concept that relates to an educational piece being offered at the SUNY College. So it's engineering, maybe 3D printing. If it's uh, a nursing program, maybe uh, you know a, a hospital or whatever. They can come in and relocate within a mile of the campus and get 10 years of free real property taxes. I think we're on the same page for this. Keep talking. And 10 years of income tax exemptions for all their employees. So the employees come in, they don't have to pay state income taxes for 10 years, and whatever development occurs on that property will not contribute to the tax base for 10 years. So my, I think it gets worse. It will get worse. No, 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 listen. I think that there's even a caveat in that law that if they have a set, if a college has a satellite someplace else, and it's the one mile radius from your satellite too. It can be. So it could be spattered so, throughout Ulster County, I'm just saying. So the town board has a responsibility to the town residents. The village board has a responsibility to the village residents, the school to school children and their parents. It, the uh, no, to seven different no, no, towns. No, all over, school. school children and their parents. They're all over. And the all taxpayers in seven towns. towns. <laughs> so everybody historically has been trying to take care of their own needs. And it's understandable. But this new initiative by the governor now puts us all at risk. So we as a town need to increase our tax base so that we can afford to do construction projects for a firehouse and a school district and a town hall, etc. But right now we don't have the tax base and the governor's initiative threatens the development of our existing tax base, which is located pretty much within a mile around the college. So my point is, my idea was for us as a community to designate the middle school property 
as the tax-free zone for our area, all right? What that will do is it will increase the value of that property dramatically because now it has 10 years of guaranteed tax exemptions. That benefits the college now because they're 3D initiative. You can be, bring in 3D companies, invite them to a particular spot in our community and have the governor lay off everything else. And what do you do? You build an addition onto the high school. I already know that you have adequate fields because you've said that. You've well, we done researched that this exclusively. And that, there's no need to buy any more property. You're fine the way you are, and it would look great with a nice turf field because I was just at Roosevelt High School yesterday. But let me tell you I know. something. No, I know. no, no, no. There's I know no it's not research out there. No, 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 no. I know it's not. But I don't think we have enough fields. Right. Forget this is a different meeting. My point, are we here to discuss the financial impact of this current plan? We are. In a bigger word. In a bigger picture. Because I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. And That's fine. So exactly. my point is, if we could create that and designate that property as the tax-free zone property, you probably will be in a better position in the long run than spending $35 million on a building that your own appraisers say the building itself is only worth $5 million. Not the property. The property's worth a lot more. The building itself is worth $5 million. That's your own appraisal. And you're going to dump $35 million into a building worth $5 million. Kevin, I really understand what you're saying, but I'd like to give other people a yeah, chance. Go ahead. But the right. bottom line is the board did look at all of that, and they chose a four-campus model because in order to do some of what you're saying, we wouldn't be able to. We really don't believe that taxpayers can afford over a $100 million project. It wouldn't be and it would be phased yes, in would. in different places. <laughs> yes, but we did exhaustive, just We did exhaustive <laughs> research for that. But I really would like to go to Eric and then to Fong sure. so that we can answer some specifics. Okay, so um, I missed the first 15 minutes, so maybe this was covered. So uh, Mr. Barry's quoted in uh, the record as, as saying that um, taxpayers can see a tax spike of at least 9% the second year and the fourth year, which is 30%. Uh, over the next five years, so do you still stand by those numbers? Is that it's actually two tax fights will occur in two different times. And the total, and I'll give you my numbers, I'll make a copy for you before I leave, showing the, the actual tax impact of the project as it was written with two phases is 9.46%. And, and Rick took these numbers, I have no idea what No, because numbers. the yeah. proposal is only one I'll phase, not copy. two. It's so. now one phase, but nobody knows that until now. No, that's yes, they do. I don't understand no. where you're Your going. Your facilities plan that you adopted had two phases in it. But the bottom line is the capital project is based on the plan and, and never that, came out with two phases. It but, came out with but, this project. I understand what you're doing. But your <coughs> own work identified $30 million worth of infrastructure. And you're still leaving some. And I know that what you said. I'll check that to see if it's all air conditioned. It says home, a second, a large portion. Okay, but and large still, security as well. You're still leaving your basic infrastructure undone by doing this project. That was like the now basic yeah. infrastructure. I'll make, that's I'll make that's that's correct. Correct. You. Whatever you're saying, the, the tax levy, the last tax levy will be increased by 9%. How is that possible? Have what, you ever what, seen what, just to be clear, what's left, left out? What you have, Eric, our business, our business assistant superintendent for business. Is I'll make copies for everybody. Okay, because I mean, it's we've already determined that it's based on information that's not germane to this project. So why we're going to continue but, looking at those but numbers? But stop for a second. His know. question was he had a legitimate question, and he just wanted to find out the accuracy of it. And if what Rick's response to that was, Rick hasn't been able to respond to it, that's except it. for the fact, as he understands, because he hasn't been able to unpack uh, Mr. Barry's. Information, but he will share it with us because he has no reason not to, and he's always right. said he would. But some. But the bottom line is, could you please let me speak? I apologize for my shortness, but um, but the bottom line is, it's our understanding that that includes something that has nothing to do with this project. We're specifically speaking to that project, not to the facilities plan that identified everything, 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 everything. The board made an assertive decision to do what they felt the taxpayers could afford and that were the basic needs of what the children had to bring it up to present code and to add some new spaces. What's being added at the high school is just exactly what was in the original of the classrooms, right? The original was well, a little less than what was originally planned right. because we didn't go that far. But the needs are still there. I, I so understand. those same so, things are there. So it's the middle school is the biggest issue. 
because it's the oldest facility and the board made a selective decision from that facilities plan as to what was going to create this project. So we're speaking to this project. So in this article, uh, Mr. Linden refutes and stands by his numbers, and you still stand by his numbers, correct? Yeah, I, did you get the sheet? I went over yeah, the I, I, I yes. don't see anything. I don't see how a, a levy could increase that much based on on the cap, how, how we could increase. If you're talking about, you're talking about tax levy here, but one percent, five point three. But but but, but, but don't get it confused it within and without. That's this. Okay. This isn't inside the two percent tax cap. Uh, okay. So you yeah. need. Can you explain that for Eric sure. so he understands that? Just so you understand, Eric, the tax cap has to do with the operational budget. Uh, this is a capital project, which is separate from the typical. But budget. debt service. Debt so service is built into the cap tax cap calculation. But that doesn't limit the tax cap. This project doesn't limit the tax cap. Why don't you explain okay. that a little bit better? All right. Let's suppose the tax cap in an OE are come up to 1.7% or 2%, any number you want. This additional 1% <coughs> by the tax cap formula is a, it increases the cap by 1%. So if your normal cap was 2.3, the year that this goes into effect, which would be 1516, your cap would be 3.3. If this doesn't pass, your cap still can work there. Which is so true. in effect is in effect exempt from the cap because they, they say the voters have already approved. So is there any way that that calculation for the debt service could come out to uh, Mr. Barry's numbers of five point three? Sure, if I borrow the money over five years, it's still twenty. If you okay. borrow the money over fifteen and twenty, as you said, it would be five point three. Not no, the way it was structured. No. The board chose this form to structure it so that it wouldn't be such an impact on the What he's done is taken this impact and try to spread it over yeah, that's over time. Thing. And in the process, if you look at his spreadsheet, in the last four or five years, where he should be just paying on the $15.5 million bond, a million ninety thousand, he's paying two point four. So what he's done is he's back loaded the number so that he could try to keep a constant amount of debt on the books. Now, that's assuming that you don't borrow. Can we stop for a moment? Wait a second. Rick that already that, explained this. It assumes that you don't borrow any more money for the next 20 years. But like he did with the past debt, he's moved it into the new debt. Right. So right. That we look at those kinds of things. And all of that he explained. And this was the plan the board chose because they their goal was to not have huge spikes in tax levy and make sure that it goes over time. Now, Fawn had a question, if you don't mind, Eric, and then I'll come back to you if you have another one. I Unless you would like you to can finish. finish. Let it All right, then go ahead. I've always been curious, um, don't we still have money in the capital? Capital reserve. like 1.2? What's, what's the plan there? 700,000. So we have 700,000 in the capital reserve. The plan in, in, in is actually right on the ballot for this. It says that we can use that for this project. Okay. And if the board uses it, we'll borrow less money. Authorizes the board to use that 700,000. It's in the proposition. I assume they probably will, but that would be the board's decision. Wasn't that 1.2? Yeah, we used 500,000 for the bond that we passed last May, so we wouldn't have borrowed for it. Okay. The safety and security bond. Right, right. Are we good to move to bond? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Extra one point two million, not seven. Okay. Well, 
Well, who's ever, you know. I, I know people watching this movie probably glazed over yeah. early on no, in this whole discussion. Um, but John Q. Public, I just want to say, the bottom line is what I'm paying in taxes. And with this 1% increase, I know you don't have revenues, but um, other than the, our tax dollars, we have sales tax, um, things like that to, to offset your costs. But if you could stay under the tax cap, even with this 1%, and you know, to do this and then follow it up with, what, when, we, when, that, when that last project was voted down, we were followed up with a 4% tax increase for almost for operations. for operations. I know you can't do that again, but you don't have to max out that tax cap every year either. The county's, you know, cutting things back. The town has been cutting taxes. Um, I hope they can continue to do that. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, just, just keep that in mind as a school board. We are, and we're also looking for alter alternative funding sources for a variety of different because and we've been applying for grants for either sustainable energy, like solar, and the things that come along. So, and, and, and when they mentioned about saying. putting solar on the on your leach field, mm -hmm. I have to wonder what happens if you have to dig up your leach field. But that's that's another topic altogether. That's that's another argument. Um, one of my other concerns is historically, as we've done different projects, like the cleaning out of the asbestos in the middle school, and a lot of that predated a lot of your service, but. One of the reasons that gymnasium gets ridiculously hot is because the asbestos was removed from the pipes and no insulation was put back on it. Those heating parts were supposed no, to be No, that's not true. Okay, yeah, that's she, no, actually, she's mostly okay. true. Mostly true. Um, in the energy performance contract, we put it back on. But it wasn't okay. put it back on in for about 10 years. <laughs> and and, um, and Maresco did that. And the original plans for watch. that middle school, uh, for the high school rather, included more classrooms than they ended up building. We've talked about that several Several and times. And full gym. So, the gym's not coming. So, when I, so, and I also have concerns about how we maintain things. There should be some kind of ongoing maintenance. I try to do that with my buildings. I try to do some ongoing maintenance. We, we have, um, I have to stop you for a second. We have a significant maintenance plan. If they weren't doing such a good job, we wouldn't even have extended the life of some of the systems that should have died a long time ago. But you're going to have 38,000 so more square feet. So they the have yeah. really done a phenomenal mm -hmm. job. You're right, and that would mean that we would have to fill the positions that we haven't filled in order to redirect it to educational programs. Well, I see um, I see some of the same problems at the middle school that I saw the last time. They have been correct. So That's some of those, true. Some of those things. If, if you had corrected them, we have to pick up the whole nut for. I understand, but I just I have concerns about that. So I guess the bottom line is I would feel more comfortable about all your numbers and projections. Um, what would you think about going to the state and meeting with um, Jean Godet and Louise Gallery and um, maybe well, even going Jim, up Rick, with some members? Rick of, has spoken to them. I think what he needs to do is contact Carl Thurno who is their boss, and to, and to see if this is a standard practice, because I have been in the business for 39 years, and I've been a, in a, a superintendent or in a position that actually had direct input into capital projects, and never once did I understand, other than the architects working with, to come up with the data that they gave us, that a business administrator would sit down with state ed prior to um, going to the design phase. And so that, that really surprises me. But if that's the new standard, by all means, I'm going to ask Rick to contact ask Jean, them cool. anyway. I wish somebody he spoke uh, to Jean. He spoke to her once and did not speak to Louise. No, he did not speak to no. Louise. Just, just, just go back and forth, forth. I just want you to know one thing, that the operational tax level, the operational budget, has basically contributed to a 4% increase in the tax levy for the last five years. You take the the average of the five, and I've done it, Steve, divided by five, is 4.07 percent tax levy increase. So, what's going to well, happen? In the past five years, that sounds right. So, if, if it continues at the same rate, and the reason why I'm worried is because <coughs> the town board paid $160,000 for police retirement last year. We just got a bill for $400,000. So, we have to try to figure out how we're not going to raise taxes by 4 percent just for that one item. So by doing what Rick did here, okay, 
you don't, you're going to lose the benefit of the buffer of retiring debt that you have to smooth out the numbers over time. So by, by, by re, Maria, if you're retiring debt, you're creating more room, okay, for other things that are unanticipated. So now you're not going to have that buffer anymore because you're not retiring any debt. It's going to be constant. Well, I disagree. Could you wait a minute? Could we ask the person who actually does this for a living to respond to that? Let me, just, let that. me just ask this question. If that money is capital money, I thought that 1%, the, the money that he was talking about retiring, is out of a different... It's, no, it's out of the debt, debt service. service. It's out of, debt, out of capital. So the debt service is part of the budget. Could we please let the business administration... No, you may budget? not. I, I would like to answer... I'm going to answer it's, it's, her question. She asked me. My point to you is this. If you look at their budget, there's a line by line, and the last page of it shows what they pay for their bonds and what the total district debt is. When you go to the revenue uh, line, the revenue budget, it shows you what they get in you know, building aid and all those other things. My point to you is, as you retire debt, you're also losing the associated building aid. So the net of the two is what you have to work with going forward. If you don't need to absorb that money because your retirement benefits are going up, then there's a tax break by the difference between those two numbers. However, the way this is done, you're never going to get the benefit of the reduction in the debt to offset operational expenses going forward. We historically pay for it too much. That's not, could you, no, that's right, not, now I'd like to hear, now I'd like to ask my question, so great. So, let me correct a few things. Some of what Kevin says, right, some of it's quite right. Um, if we had no project at all, we absolutely have retiring debt, I had mentioned before that that 1% that this would add is on top of the cap. If the debt retired, it would lower the cap, so we couldn't visit <coughs> operational things like retirement or other things. It would lower the tax levy because the cap would go down. But it would not be able to be used, for instance, for retirement or classroom teachers or anything else. That debt, whether it's being added to this 1% or whether it goes down, affects the cap directly. Okay. So the cap would go down. So you couldn't use it for anything else. No, but you would be, you would be in a position where, where now you're going to be short money, and now you've got to cut programs and teachers. That's, okay. it. Yeah, that's, that's why a, we want to do what right. we're doing. With the yeah. Yeah. So what you're trying to do yeah. is yeah. tell the taxpayers that this project is designed to protect your your ability to finance your operational budget going forward. So this is a kind of a gimmick to do that. Well, no, hold on. Yeah, let me let me go back. As as you can see by what we're discussing right now and what Kevin brought up and what he's bringing up now about that we're losing the, the, the buffer that could be created on the tax levy by actually letting the retiring debt just retire without replacing it with other debt. What are we actually talking about when we're talking about that? We're talking about not fixing our buildings. It gets back to the question that I was talking about 45 minutes ago, which is, is your objection to Rick's work and the board's work that resulted in this document and this potential repayment schedule that the public would benefit from if the bond is approved? Or are we talking about that you just don't think that we should fix these buildings and you don't want to spend the money? Because if, if Kevin is talking about that we need to gain the benefit of allowing this retiring debt to just retire without replacing it with newly incurred debt, then we're talking about we don't want the, we don't want the buildings fixed. We don't want the project. We, we think the buildings are fine. And over the next 20 years when this retiring debt is happening, we're just going to keep letting the buildings decay. And then you're going to come back to us and say, why aren't you maintaining the buildings? Why are we now firing teachers to fix things out of operating budget costs when we could have taken out a loan and fixed them from a different budget line? And so that's really what we came down here today to talk about. We came here to talk about the financing. The question arose, and a newspaper article was written, that that the way we're describing the financing of this project to the public is somehow inaccurate. And this, this meeting was publicized as a way to discuss the financing Finance. arrangement. And so to see if we could get everybody to understand that it's a good financial plan. But instead, the conversation for the second half of this meeting has been steered in a very different direction, which is that should we be doing this at all? 
And it's the same thing I talked about. Do we need a new town hall? Yes, we do. I don't want to talk about it. No, I'm not talking about it. Maria, please, let me. We're talking about the conversation has now gone into a different direction when, than what this meeting was supposed to be. We're no longer talking about whether this is, a, is an accurate and good financial plan that, that keeps payments smooth for the public over the entire 20 years and at a 1% change in their existing levy, which is what we claim it does, and I think that at this point we've certainly adequately demonstrated that it does. And for the second half of the meeting, we've unfortunately been steered into a discussion about whether we should be doing the project at all. And so that's not what we came here to do. So let's not do that. Questions. Well, it, I just wanted to sum <laughs> something up. That, and and I'm, I'm still trying to sort through all these numbers and the information that I've gotten. I've been following the project there, and I haven't had a chance to look at, at Kevin's numbers. And, and I have to tell you, I have a great deal of respect for, for Kevin's um, knowledge and information and the work that I've watched him do it at the town level and at other places. I'm very impressed with, with many of the people that are here that are questioning this and probably know it better than I do. So I'm still trying to keep an open mind. But I, I agree, if you're going to do the work, keeping that tax levy, when I look at the figures, and, and it's not whether this is a good project or not, I'm not even sure this is the right project, you know, I haven't made up my mind yet. But if you're going to, if, it, if this bond passes and you finance it this way, is the most painless way to do it overall in my lifetime. I know there's going to be other things that come. I know that debt will never be totally retired. Um, I know before we get 15 years out, there's going to be other things we're going to want to bond. We're going to have to think this is the last bond we're going to have in the next 20 years would be naive. Um, so, you know, that's that's not the question. I guess um, I, I don't have, I think you've given us I think the numbers there, as far as that procedure for retiring the debt, is um, probably the most painless way to do it. Um, recognizing the fact that it's going to cost us more money overall. Yes, and that um, was never. But it was always out there. But so, as far as that goes, um, like you said, if, if that's the only way we can afford to do it, if the only way we can afford to keep our house, and frankly, that's the only way I can afford to keep my house is to do it that way, because um, if it goes up five percent. Yeah. Um, I'm going to lose my house. Me too. And, um, me too. But, you, but I want to reiterate, back to the point I was originally making, you're going to have to really look at your operational costs at the same time. You can't be, you know, you're not going to, 2% every year is, you know, on, on top of what it is already, is huge amount of money. You know, 2% so of $10 is $2. 2% of $100 is, you know, Oh, sorry, it's, it's, I did say that wrong. I said that wrong. We know you. <laughs> so, yeah. we know you know, you when you, and and so those, those increases for me to come up with an extra, you know, two or three thousand dollars a year to pay the, the taxes on my properties is is significant. It's not something I'm going to be able to do. My, my husband and I invested in rental properties with the thought that we would live off that. I have no mortgage and I'm losing money. You know. Um, on, on rental properties, which is just unheard of. All the money that should be going to a mortgage should be going into my, to, to supporting me, and I can't, I can't support myself in New Paltz. I don't want New Paltz to turn into Marlboro, where I had a house for sale in Marlboro and a house for sale right across the school line. They, the two houses were almost identical, going for the same, you know, for the same price, and the taxes on them was almost double between Marlboro and, and the school district and the Walkville school district, or whatever the neighbors, I think it was Highland. But, it was almost double the taxes. And that's starting to happen where the, you get to the edge of the New Paltz School District and the next town, like New Paltz and Highland. Our school taxes are significantly higher. And it's- But the cost per thousand is significantly lower. Which is interesting, because the assessed values in this district go along with the quality of some of the educational programming and the things that we provide for our students. And their assessment is so not made up at the same rate that ours. There's a lot of exempt properties. Yeah. We do. Um, You're absolutely right. That's another issue that he's absolutely So I'm just saying that, that you know, you all live in the district so you won't feel our pain, but um, I just, you know. I, I, I think need to the takeaway from picture. this is that we deliberately made sure that you needed the 1% was on top of the operating budget. And we felt that that was very important. And the board's directive to Rick was to figure out a process for repayment would be the least impact on the taxpayer paying 
not on the, the total overall cost of the taxpayer paying for that with the reasons that were explained today. Um, and what I'm also hearing you say is that if the tax levy, the 2% tax levy when it's calculated is 2.8%, you don't have to go to the 2.8 with the 1% on top. Perhaps, the bill, perhaps you can maintain the educational programs at 2% rather than adding the extra 0.8%. I'm just using yeah. examples. But I think that's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, and to be you can do that this is just one more percent on top of it. You're not saying that it might not be the right project for you, but the bottom line is to, to continue <coughs> to look at the overall taxes, taxes that, par that you're paying, not just the tax form. I mean, and I know it's, I was a teacher. Uh, my daughter was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. <laughs> I have lots of cousins who were teachers. Um, they do a great job, and um, we certainly can't afford to pay them what they're worth. But um, really tough decisions have to be made at every level, with teachers, with administrators. Um, uh, so now we're going off the topic. <laughs> yeah, I have, no, I'm serious. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just it's past it to us yeah. 6 o'clock, and I promised yeah. that it would end at 6. Yeah. So are there any specific yeah. questions to the reason why the board chose this financing? Or those numbers and I will let you know that yes Rick will be calling state ed and he will be having a conversation with them because I'm extremely curious about the change in protocol as outlined by Kevin well Maria you're not known to be a numbers person I know you've said that yourself I so. told that's what I told Ed when he was trying to show me but his she's numbers. a process person but that's I am a definite process person and I also <laughs> when, you, when you talk to Jean but Ed I'm not talking to Rick somebody should <laughs> Somebody should, and I talk. I got to a numbers person All sitting right. next so, to me. So uh, my my point today is this: I'll just sum up. Your numbers aren't right, Rick. And you just should have checked them all with state ed before you put them out to the public. That's my and point. I'm going to say Go right ahead. now that Kevin Barry's opinion is they are not right. And right. I'm going to say that I stand by the fact that the way that the board asked him to do it, and that his numbers are correct, and that we will further go forward and check out state ed. So your opinion, I absolutely respect is coming from you. And the other thing that I really respect is your due diligence to really try to find out everything. Well, I'm surprised and nobody so else did that. Well, I'm sorry, but we did. Well, and we have, <laughs> the board's gone through a variety of this. So um, I greatly appreciate yeah. everyone coming. If after this percolates in your mind and you do have some questions and you would like to hear the answers come from the district from what we have to research and do or whatever, Please feel free to contact Rick Linden directly, and he will give you what we know to be true, but he will also look, do more research if you need to. Just out of curiosity, I mean, what, what's your takeaway? What's your conversation going to be? What questions did you hear that you think we need answered? I mean, I, I can call state in again. As I said, I did talk to Jean, and until what she told me, but I'll reconfirm it, until I have plans to meet with her to go over, she can't give me any state data. And and that's what you told me. Right. And I'll call and her it's not about how many times you talk about it. But there's another about person in state ed. And I want to tell you something right now. Sometimes whoever's in state ed and somebody else who's in, who's in um, facilities planning, they might not be saying the same thing. So what Kevin said could be absolutely 100% correct. And Rick could have gotten something from one person. Since he didn't talk to the other person, he doesn't know what Kevin was told from that person. So he needs to contact that person. But I really want him also speak with Car Carl, Car Carl Therno and to find out what is the new standard of practice because if process has changed then we need to be up with it but I'm going to tell you from the last time I talked to the Colombo group and KG&D architects we followed the process up to this point but it doesn't mean I don't want Rick to contact state ed and both of the people he spoke to in addition to their boss. I did hear from Kevin he said in his conversation they said state ed not get paid interest on it. I would love to just well, we're receiving it, so I'd like to know just, if that's changed. Yes. Because there may be a change in the law right. that's like going to gonna go that's forward to new projects that we're not aware of, nor are our uh, architects who right. did the And is it at the rate system. that you have calculated? And Which is while, exactly while, what While you're mean. talking, also talk, talk to Chuck Sabaro. 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 Sabaro may Sabaro. have some money available to you. He does. There's money available for future when you take two school districts and merge. Oh, yeah, he said, listen to me, under some circumstances, they make that money available. 
idea of the district consolidates their facility space. So talk to them about that. Right. But, but we already we already tried that. to pursue that. <laughs> um, if you do talk to them, can you get her to put something in writing about, you know, yes. maybe review your numbers and, and give us an opinion? I have some plans on how we're going to address that, but Perfect. I do believe that we do need to have something I just want to take in writing or even a, a tape or some, something from state ed to verify the conversation and what we were told to do. So the board's going to need that information. I just have one last Yes, sir. First of all, I, I do want to say quickly, I want everybody to think that this is against children or against spending money. That's not the case. That is not the case. There's a man here. I have to say that. that everyone here, and, and as a matter of fact, I, I, I think the greatest problem is that the community feels that the board doesn't respect us as a resource. That Kevin's research is not a good resource. That here's George Seafree, a great builder, who knows more about building than anything. So all these people here are a resource. And we don't feel that we're being reached out to in the community. I'd, I'd really like to see more of that. But my question is that when we had the $50 million middle school budget, there, were, there was a lot more information. I, I, I know I couldn't escape being informed. I had, I had mailings that went to my post office box. And, I, I, and this is my question. I don't, I, don't have, I don't have the time or the inclination or the desire to go sit on the New Paul Central School website and read every little bit that goes in there. If I did, I'd, I'd go directly to a psychiatrist. I, so where are the mailings? Where, well, where we'll be getting one on the board. Where is the outreach on the part of the board? Uh, the board has been everywhere in this community I haven't doing seen presentations. It. I haven't seen They've it. gone physically. I've gone, I did two presentations two days ago. I did it, we did another one last night. I, we gave a tour of it. We have been out there. We have been told that we need to do both mailings as well. We did two mailings so far. We're doing another one, and that will be out on Friday. Right, let me give you my um, but the biggest sign up for their email. Yeah. What's that? Can I add something to that that I think is very important? You know, yes, I did just get reelected to the board in in May, and I was not on the board while this project was in development. However, and Nick will attest to this. I sure showed up to a whole bunch of the developmental and public information meetings over the year and a half that they were working at it, and I made suggestions. That's not and a I raised question. Hold on, I'm, I'm talking about during the time that this project was in development, the fact that the meetings' agendas were including slideshows by architects and public input and all kinds of questions was was well out there because, and I wasn't alone in showing up to these meetings. Lots of people did, and one of the questions that's been in my mind that we've talked about openly all along is. Where has everybody been during this time? Because like, the last time, we had people with us constantly in packed rooms for like eight months. And this time around, that didn't materialize. But it wasn't because the, the board wasn't making it well known that this is what they were researching and this is what their presentations were being about. So, so it, it is unfortunate that some people are just becoming engaged now that there's... But that's not a question. Can I go back to this? I wanna, the bottom again, line was about finish. print materials. Right, what I was saying too. Is that print? You know, print materials have already gone out, and a couple of more items will be. But we're, as far as during the process, you know, in earlier in earlier budget cycles, we used to mail out a lot of stuff, and and then in terms of trying to keep the tax levy down, we were thinking, no, let's do what people are asking us. Let's be good for the environment. Let's save money. Let's do more electronic communications and less mailings. Try to picture us between that rock and that hard place, where on the one hand you're sending out mail, and then people are coming down saying, why are you wasting so much money on postage? Why are you generating so much recycling? And then you know, we try to save money on the budget and stay under that 2% by reducing general mailings over the course of the year and increasing electronics communications. We but can't be in all, you know, all let me places just, at all let times. Me, we <laughs> deliberately were trying to do more electronic and social networking as well as having a variety of meetings all over the district, which means different places. In regard to print media, you're right. We really haven't been doing that. We only planned three, but you know, and that kind of thing. So at the superintendent's um, network, I asked for a group of people across section of the community to give me advice. 
that came up, right, Ed? It said, you know what, Maria, you got to get more print media out. So I apologize to you because it was not an oversight, it was a planned oversight because we thought that we were reaching everyone from these other medias. So that's why Friday's newsletter is going out. It's got it's going to include some of the other pieces of information that I got advice from this cross section of community members in order to do that. So I am so sorry. Did he leave? Maria, and it's also that there is well and right. There's a lot of other things. Four years ago, yeah. this thing was front and center. Well. Yeah. Okay, but but I but I understand. I hear what you're saying, and 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 I did hear that from others just recently. Thank you. You didn't apologize. Did thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you also. Thank you. I think the way that uh, yeah. the monies have got spread out, and you minimize the tax levy, assuming that all these numbers are right, is perfect. So what we might need to do is to give you more comfort with the numbers being correct yes. from our standpoint. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to take your advice and contact State Ed and find out if things are different. And I, I have no doubt what you were told is what you were told. I do have doubt whether or not it was accurate. But if it is accurate, then I want to know where the state guidance was and why we wouldn't have known it or our or KG and data. Well, it's particularly so that's, that's different very now. important. Whenever you've got rehab and building, it's a very unusual proposition for them. Okay, so it's not a typical kind of transaction. So Actually, like all, all across the that. state, they do not, it all the time. Not a whole building. Oh, yeah, I think, I think so. But, um, thank, you. thank you, everybody. Have a good night, everyone.